The really um, interesting and rather amazing thing about Epstein vi virus is that over the years we've been discovering more and more uh, diseases that are actually caused by it or associated with it. Um, okay, Burkitt lymphoma, as that uh, the tumour became uh, known, was the one that it was first isolated from, but then not long after it was found to cause uh, infectious mononucleosis or glandular fever in um, young uh, teenagers and adults in Western world. Um, then, uh, quite by chance, it was found to be associated with a tumour um, very common in Asia, and particularly southern China, called nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Um, and now we know that it's also uh, the cause of um, lymphomas that develop in people who are immunocompromised, in particular um, people who have had uh, transplants of some sort and have to be uh, immunocompromised to uh, prevent rejecting their grafted organ. And uh, finally, Hodgkin's lymphoma, a proportion of those tumours are also associated with the virus. So that's quite difficult to get your head around, really. And, and I'm going to hand over to Alan Rickinson, to, who um, can tell us about some of the, uh, the ways that, that these um, associations have been discovered. Yeah, well, one of the fascinating things about this story is, that, is the role that chance and circumstance plays in the development of the story. I mean, it's true, generally, of, of scientific research, but it's particularly well exemplified, I think, by the UV story. So, I mean, let's just pick one example. Uh, to go back to the early years, within two years of the discovery of, of Epstein-Barr virus, um, there was an attempt uh, to show just how specific the relationship with, with Burkitt lymphoma was. And so people were taking uh, blood samples from uh, patients with Epstein-Barr virus and measuring the level of antibodies, uh, the level of the immune response against the virus to check whether it was in some way abnormal. And what was found was that, that Burkitt patients had very high levels of antibodies to, to, to this virus. And most people, although they were infected by the virus, uh, did not. So there was a distinction there. So the, the, the fact that the antibody response was raised was somehow a marker of the specificity of the disease. But in the very early uh, studies uh, that were being conducted again in, in collaboration with people in Africa, uh, in the endemic areas uh, where Burkitt was, where Bur Burkitt lymphoma was so common, um, one of the characters in the story was Peter Clifford, who was an ENT surgeon. Uh, not in Uganda, but in, in Nairobi, um, in Kenya. And he was collaborating with, uh, with investigators in, in, the, in the US and sending serum samples. So he was sending serum samples from his Burkitt lymphoma patients. But of course, they needed controls. People with other tumors who apparently would have no relationship to EBV just to measure the antibody levels. And in, among the controls in the very first study was uh, uh, samples from patients with this rare nasopharyngeal carcinoma, this tumor of the nasal space, and which, although most common in Southeast Asia, is actually also seen in particular areas of Kenya. And it turned out in the very first studies that these patients with nasopharyngeal carcinoma also had very high antibodies. Now, to the cynic, this means, oh, well, you know, the, there's nothing special about Burkitt lymphoma. Maybe many people have got high antibodies. Um, but ultimately, it turned out that by pure chance, they'd struck upon the, another tumor which was strongly associated with, with the virus, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. That was a starting point. And from there, the work moved to Asia, to Southeast Asia, particularly to um, people in Hong Kong, John Ho in Hong Kong, who ran nasopharyngeal carcinoma clinics because it's one of the most common tumors of men throughout southern China. And in Hong Kong, he was able to conduct the studies and find that, yes, exactly the same immunological picture came up there, that Chinese patients with the, with the tumor also had very strong antibodies. So all of a sudden, it seems that not one, but two tumors were associated with this virus. This was a total shock because the nasopharyngeal tumor was actually a tumor of skin lining cells, of epithelial cells, not lymphocytes, not white blood cells. So it was a completely different cell type. And here the virus was getting in there somehow. How was that happening? Um, questions that are still actually uh, valid today because some of, the, some of those issues still haven't been resolved. But we now know 
from molecular evidence that this nasopharyngeal carcinoma is just as even more strongly associated with uh, this virus than is Burke lymphoma. So it's a remarkable coincidence that in the very first study they happened to strike the one other tumor that was so consistently associated with the virus. Um, great skepticism all around, but actually it turned out to be right. Um, there are, of course, many other such examples. Um, so let's talk about post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. This is the tumor, again, a tumor of white blood cell origin that the virus causes in patients who are immunologically compromised, particularly patients who are receiving um, uh, suppressive drugs, uh, having received transplants. Um, and it took, us, it took people a while to, to tumble the fact that this could possibly be associated with the DBV. And my co-author was actually one of the people, the, actually the first purple to, person to, to tumble this. Um, and uh, over to you, Dorothy, tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK. It's a silly story, really. But anyway, I've been looking out for tumours uh, in immunosuppressed people for some time to test for Epstein-Barr virus because we had a pretty rapid test by that stage. We didn't have to use the electron microscope or anything. And I'd just moved um, to the Royal Free Hospital uh, in London, which is a tall, thin building. And, uh, of course, everybody moves from floor to floor in the lift. So the lift is the place where you actually meet people, or more likely waiting outside the lift, actually. Um, and so one day I was waiting out outside the lift. The lift came, we all trooped in, and I happened to be standing next to um, some transplant surgeons who were having a conversation and I was eavesdropping and uh, they were talking about their first patient, uh, renal transplant patient, who um, had this lymphoma. And so I was so excited, I, I actually didn't have the nerve to say to them straight away, but I scurried back to the lab and uh, contacted the pathology laboratory who had some of this tumour material. And so I was able to get it and um, I was actually working in the immunology, immunology department at the time and we stained it up there and sure enough it was positive. It was so exciting, I can tell you. We were all really absolutely beside ourselves with... Uh, Joy, and anyway, uh, we published that, and it was the first one, but just one, you know, one swallow doesn't make a summer. Um, but then, of course, other, other people um, found more tumours, and they did turn out to be um, positive for Epstein-Barr virus, so they're an, another tumour that it's associated with.